enjoyed yesterday's Q&A session. If you were able to come, we had to kind of pivot because of the cold, wet weather and did something inside. Hadn't really done it before. Kind of this Q&A session with Annika and Catherine Muzi, who had just graduated from college and is now turning pro. And um, I just thought it was an incredible session just to pick Annika's brain, Catherine's brain, not just on golf tips, but life tips. And some of the questions you all asked were amazing. And I cannot tell you how many parents and players, they came up to me and just said what a wonderful session it was. So hopefully you all got something out of it if you were there. And we're going to continue tonight with kind of this more than golf philosophy that we have because we want you to have a great experience inside the ropes, but we want to help you have a wonderful experience outside the ropes and learn something from the week so you can go back and do even greater things inside and outside the ropes when you go home to your communities. But tonight we'll have a couple different parts to our session. Uh, the first part I'm going to introduce a pretty well-known sports psychologist who I think is considered the grandfather, if you will, of sports psychology. But before I do that, I just wanted to share a quick story. Taylor, my colleague, is going to cringe because she thinks I talk too much. But I'm a golfer. Uh, the son I played college golf, so I was a parent of a junior golfer, played AJGA. So I understand the whole journey. And I love to play, except I only play during working hours, just in case Anik is listening. Um, but uh, so I'm a, you know, if I break 80, I'm a happy guy. So through eight holes, I was two under on my home course. And I was trying to, you know, breathe deep and stay relaxed. Come to the ninth hole, par five, water in play on every shot. So you're not, so I, I suppose you're going to guess what I did. But on my drive, stayed my routine, had a good drive, thankfully. But I had to hit my approach shot between water left and right, winds blowing, trying to stay in my routine, positive thoughts. Thankfully, I get it in play. So now I'm just getting a wedge to the green. All carry over water, bunkers in the back. So sometimes it doesn't look like there's a lot of green. And I'm like, OK, I just keep breathing. Two under, no problem, stay in my routine. And of course, as I pull the club back, I start getting a little bit apprehensive and a little tentative. And guess what I do? I chunk it in the freaking water, make double. And I was like, why do I do that? Why do I let negative thoughts come into my head? Because like, I can control that. And so that happened a couple months ago. So I started reading books and whatever. And so now I'm like, OK, I just have to make sure before I get a shot, I've got really positive thoughts. You know, because it's helping me do my best. And if I have negative thoughts or apprehensive thoughts, that's not going to allow me to put a good swing on it. So I'm still learning, you know, throughout this journey. Maybe all of you are past this process, you know, past this issue. But maybe some of you kind of fall into that trap of maybe some negative thinking or apprehensive thinking. So we invited a well-known sports psychologist, Dr. Bob Winters, to join us. His bio is up top, I won't read everything, but we were introduced to him by the UCF women's golf coach, Emily Merrin. He said, Emily, we'd love a sports psychologist just to talk to our players. Who do you recommend? She said, absolutely call Dr. Bob Winters. He's a motivational speaker and author, played college golf, played pro golf, and is now a sports psychologist and a performance consultant. Works with juniors, college players, a lot of pros, many pros, uh, some of them that you may have heard of, Justin Rowe, Lee Westwood, Michelle Wee. Written many books. He played college golf at Ball State in Indiana. Got his PhD at UVA. So anybody that's going to UVA, you're going to have to come up and talk to him afterwards about UVA. Got his PhD there. But Dr. Winters is here just to share some tips and guidance for you to help you hopefully perform better. But he also wants to hear from you. So I hope you have some questions for him. If you can please give a warm round of applause to Dr. Winters, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Good evening. How is everyone? Good? All right. If you look out here to the west behind you, you will see something that hasn't you know, been seen in the last 48 hours. And it's a yellow-orange orb that we call the sun. Okay, so hopefully we're going to bring that out for you tomorrow. And you know, besides you know Rob and calling me up with Taylor and Katie, I want to thank you know Coach Marone from UCF for recommending me. And I really like to say you know thank you to Anika 
and I've known Annika just a little bit over the years, and really glad to see your mom and dad, you know, here tonight. And it's just, I'm just honored to be part, you know, of this whole you know, foundation, to be a part of this group here tonight. Now I'm going to ask you something, and it may seem like the most childish question in the world. But with the athletes that I've had, you know, a chance to work with, I've worked with the very best of the best, and I've worked with some of the worst of the worst. And I always ask them this question, and I'm looking for like a knee-jerk response. It's yes or no. In relation to your golf, if I asked you, and I ask everyone, I've asked Brooks Kepka, Eye to Eye, Tony Finau, Lydia Ko, Maria Fossi, the list goes on and on. I'm not trying to drop names here. But I don't care who you are, because you know the question is, are you good? Are you good? What would you tell me? Yes or no? I'm looking for a knee-jerk response here. Because when I ask an athlete, like a young junior player, like yourselves, who are some of the best in the world, by the way, and congratulations on being here, because you are the top gun of all great players here around the world to be here in this Annika Invitational. And what I'm looking for is that knee-jerk reflex that says, yes, absolutely I am. You'd be surprised at some of the very best players in the world on the LPGA Tour, the PGA Tour, you know, European Tour, Korean Tour, to come to see me here in Orlando. I will ask them that question. And they will say things like, and they'll have sort of a pregnant pause. And they'll go, yes, but. And everyone puts out that big but out there. And you know what that means in our language. You know, everything that you said before just gets washed right out the window. So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about a story about, you know, one great player. You may never have heard of her. But she's not a fictitious or a made-up character. She lives here about an hour from here. And she came to my office at the Ledbetter Golf Academy about 15 years ago. And she was a spindly little girl, about 90 pounds, rigging wet. And she came in, and she came in with tears down her eyes. She came in with her father, Dion. And I looked at her and I said, Hi, Emily, I'm Dr. Bob Winters. And she kind of sheepishly said, Hello. And I said, Come here, let's have a seat. What's going on? Now just imagine if you or any of your friends had gone to a college and you wanted to go there for an academic scholarship but also play on the golf team. She had just gotten back from an unofficial visit to see a couple of golf coaches at a wonderful school that had won national championships. She came back and I asked her what was going on. She said, I had this visit. The coaches said they wanted me. I can get an academic scholarship, but if I wanted to play on the team, they wanted me on the team, but they told me that I probably would never play one round in tournament golf. I probably don't have the skills to make the traveling team. And then she broke down. She just started crying. And I said, well, let me ask you this, Emily. And I looked her right in the face, just like I'm looking at you. And I asked her, and I said, do you believe in your talent? Are you good? She looked at me, she wiped the tears, she goes, absolutely. And I said, here's what I'm gonna do. I said, I'm gonna leave here for 30 seconds and I'll be right back. And I walked out of the room. I came back with you know, a box of brand new tissues. And I put them right down in front of her. And I said, here's what we're gonna do. I said, we're gonna have a really good cry. And I want you to cry. And I want you to get all those tears of frustration, all those tears of discouragement, all those tears of doubt. And it's funny, being a man, and speaking for my gender, when women cry, it's not because they're weak, it's not because they're frail, it's because they're angry, they're frustrated, they're discouraged. I saw that. I recognize that. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do right now. If you are committed to me, I'll be committed to you. I said, we're going to work, and we're going to make a chance 
for you to find out how good you could be before you actually go to school there next year. So that's where you want to go, right? She goes, absolutely. Her name is Emily Flanagan Mata. Emily worked with me that whole spring, that whole summer, and we worked hard. And she did. She had tears of pain, tears of frustration, but also tears of joy. She didn't make her first two events that fall. But she finally qualified for the third event. And from that point on, Emily Mata played in 96% of this team's tournaments. She finished her last two years as captain of this squad. She finished as first team All-American. She made academic All-American three years in a row. Not only that, she actually made the transition to professional golf. She finished high up in the NCAA tournament, made the All-NCAA team. She went to play on Symmetra Tour, played some LPGA events. And because she believed, she believed in her talent, she said, my talent is just not playing, it's in teaching people. I love working with kids, I love working with juniors, I love working with people, see how they're doing. She went on to get her PGA certification. She's now the first assistant down here at a golf course that's a beautiful private club called Mountain Lake. She has been PGA section professional three years in the last eight. And she just recently played at Lake Nona Country Club. And now she qualified for the National Club Play Championship. So when people talk to you about are you good, what are we asking? We're asking, do you believe in your talent? Because whether you are Annika, whether you're Tiger, whether you're Rory, whether you're Nelly Corda, the most important thing you have when you step up on that team, tomorrow, or any tournament you're going forward, is the belief that I can handle this. I, I can only give you something, and I want you to actually to listen to me, but hear me in your head. Four words. If you don't remember my name, I'm Dr. Bob Winters, but over the years, I want this to resonate within you because this is more than golf. Golf is a great micro-macrocosm of life. If you can handle the little difficulties, the setbacks on the golf course, it's already training you for life. But there's four words, four words. I can handle this. Whatever happens to you, you have a bad lie in a fair way, you know, what happens to most girls? They start having a pity party. Uh, oh my God, look at this, this is crap. This is crap. And then you start handing out pity parties. You start handing out all these invitations to your pity party. Who comes to your pity party? No one. And here's one of the truth bombs about creating golf confidence. No one really cares what you do on the golf course. They really don't. No more than you should care. And that's really what I'm trying to help players understand, is that you play for your team. And there's three people on your team when you go out there tomorrow. Do you know who's on your team? Three people. I know everybody's kind of looking around at their coach or their parents, you know, other people. It's team you. It's made up of three very important people. Me, myself, and I. Because if it is to be, it has to begin and end with me. See, that's the whole point, you know, about playing for yourself. When we talk about playing your game, and we talk about some of these cliches in golf, well, I've got three cliches that are the golden nuggets. And whether I'm working with a young Brooks Koepka, or I'm working, you know, with an older Tony Finau, or whoever I'm working with, it still comes back to these three things the pillars of great golf. And I'm sure that Ms. 59, Annika, will agree with me. Three things. One, you play your game. It's your game. Take ownership of that game. You know, we're always talking about, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna do exactly what, you know, this person does. I'm gonna do, you know, the Nelly Corda diet. I'm gonna do, you know, the Tiger Woods regime. That's not you. One of the greatest things that I've ever heard, it was come by E.E. E. Cummings, a great American poet. He said, to be no one but yourself in a world that is constantly trying to change you to be like somebody else. 
It's the greatest battle you ever face. You have to keep fighting. And that's what I'm talking about. You have to fight for your individualism. You have to play the way you can play. You can't be looking around and say the grass is always greener. Gee, I wish I hit it, you know, 30 yards further. I wish I had a better wedge game. If you want to do something about it, then be proactive. Improve that. This is a game of constant adjustment, constant improvement. But that's the first thing. Play your game. It isn't about anybody else. The second you know, pillar is beat the course. Beat the course. Everyone around. Take a look at everyone around. Beautiful faces, unbelievable talent. I mean, my goodness, we have so much talent in here. But it's not about you beating her or you beating her. Your true opponent will be and will always be the golf course. And when you hear players talk about, well, I gotta go out and beat all these other players, they are so far behind that they think they're ahead. And they're playing a game of being average. They're playing a game of follow the followers. And the third and final thing is, do you know the most important number in golf? Do you? It's not 54, it's not 59, it's not 68, those are great numbers. The most powerful number in golf is one. It's the one shot at a time. It's what we talk about flowing with confidence, being in that moment, being mindful of the moment, giving your best at this moment. See, I ask, you know, are you good? That's what you have to have. Are you good when you step up into that shot on the first tee? Are you good when you're coming down a stretch? Are you good when you're facing adversity? You know, we always talk about good, better, best. Better means, I'll tell you what, better is feedback so I can use the information today to be better tomorrow. But the key to all of this is that you give your best, one shot at a time. It's one after one after one after one. Boring, isn't it? That's where boring is beautiful. One after one until you're done. Those three right there. Those are the ones when you hear players at an LPGA interview, at a PGA interview, you ask them, they'll say, well, what did you do to win today? And they'll be over here going, I know this sounds really stupid, but uh, I just kind of stayed in my own little bubble and uh, played one shot at a time and beat the golf course. And 99% of the world hears yada, 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 one shot at a time, yada, 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 play my own game. They don't understand. When you take ownership of knowing that, that's when you become a true player of the game. And it's funny, I've been influenced by some of the great, great minds in the world to hopefully make me you know, the very best version of Dr. Bob Winters I can be. And one of them was Dr. Seuss. You know, Dr. Seuss, the cat in the hat, how the Grinch stole Christmas. He had written the book called, Oh, the Places You Will Go. And it's funny because I read some of the bios of some of the great players and they talk about the experiences because this is more than golf. And think about where golf has taken you. It's taken you here to the Annika Invitational to meet, you know, the living legend herself, to interact, you know, with other great, you know, people. He had written the book, Oh, the Places You Will Go. And I remember at the end, Dr. Seuss, you know, he kind of left it like this. He says, your brain's in your head. Your feet are in your shoes. And you can steer them in any direction you choose. You are on your own. You know what you know. And you are the person who will decide where you will go. My whole thing for you is, I choose for you to be great. What do we learn from the Emily Mavis of the world, the Hanukkah Soren Stams, the Tiger Woods, the Rory McIlroys, the Lydia Coes? They chose their path of passion. It was a path of heart. Was it easy? No. Your path will not be easy. Thank goodness for that. Because if it was easy, everybody would be an All-American. Everyone be, would win everything. And there wouldn't be anyone who would be outstanding. And that's what outstanding means. It means you stand out by making yourself unequal from everyone else. If you want to be average, 
follow the followers. But the real great ones, like Annika, Tiger, the Nancy Lopez's, the Arnold Palmer's, the Jack Nicholas's, they listened to a different drummer. They said, this is how I do it, this is where I'm going, and I'm going to do it one step, one shot at a time. It will not only help you on the golf course, but it will help you in every avenue of your life. What were the four words? I can handle this. Let me hear you say that one time. Here we go. I what? I can handle this. Tomorrow, you have you know, a hot, tough day. And I know some of you are coming in with huge expectations. You know, you think, oh my goodness, I've spoiled my round. Here's an incentive for tomorrow. Start fresh. Put the past behind you. I mean, you are in the land of Disney. How many of you saw The Lion King? <laughs> right? Since you've been little kids. What was one of the words they said? Hakuna Matata. You put the past behind you. You move forward. The past, it's a done deal. It's history. It's Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. It's a done deal. Tomorrow is a new start. So when you go out tomorrow, I want to make sure you know, that you have tomorrow a springboard for success. If you're playing great, great right now, fantastic. That's confirmation that what you're doing is working. Continue your process. Continue to be big. But if you've been struggling, start fresh tomorrow. Because this could be a huge springboard effect for the rest of your 2024 season. I wish all of you unbelievable success here at this tournament and every tournament you play in. And I hope every time you're on the golf course, may you always find your ball at the bottom of the cup. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Bob? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. This is a free consultation. Okay. All right. If the parents, the parents have you know a question. Anyone have a question? All right. So let me give you a freebie, all right? So people ask me, because I've written, you know, the 10 most common mistakes in golf. It's called a book called Mistake-Free Golf. I've got a lot of books out there. Done a lot of work over the years. People ask me, what's the single greatest mistake other than doubting yourself? Well, here's one that you can use tonight, tomorrow. How many times have you ever been into a shot and you're back here and you're thinking about this shot and you're thinking it and you step into the ball and you know that you're not ready. You're feeling uncomfortable. But you're looking around and you're going, well, they may be timing me. I, I just better go ahead and just get it over with. I'm going to go ahead and hit it anyway. How many of you have gone ahead, hit that shot, and hit the anyway shot? Raise your hand if you are. Everyone's here. Annika raises her hand. Why did you do that? Most of us, we step into the ball, we hit the shot, we knew we know we weren't ready. We're saying, boy, just don't go right. Oh, stupid, stupid, stupid. Why didn't I just back back off? That was just so stupid. The golf ball's not going anywhere, all right? It's waiting on you. One of the most common mental mistakes that you make, that you can, do not have to make, you have total control over this. When you step into the ball, make sure you are absolutely in a green light. And so when you step in, you are assured. You have this level of certitude and confidence and confidence that says, this is what I want to do, this is where I want my ball to go. Most players who play, they choose the road of fear. Golf is a game. It's a fork in the road. Do you go out to play great, or do you go out to not screw up? And I guarantee you, 99% of everybody know that I've worked with that have problems, they're going out here. They're trying to avoid screwing up. Not the one percenters, not the people that are great. They say, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to go down with guns blazing. That doesn't mean you play with reckless abandon. It means you play smart, aggressive. And one of the biggest things you can do is step back here and get yourself clear. Be decisive. When I step into the ball, boom. And if I'm unsure, I'm going to step back. One of the little secrets I've got, you can see it right here in my hand. It's a little rubber band. A little rubber band. I've given it to several of my players a few years ago. 
Jody York Shadoff is coming down the stretch in the British Open. I can see her, and I've been telling her, every time you feel, you know, your mind gets a little wandering, snap that rubber band. Snap that rubber band. When she came down the stretch, she ended up, you know, finishing solo, solo second. But that was her highest finish in the major up to that point. She said, I just couldn't believe how my mind was just running away with me. And let's talk about the commentators that sit in the booth. She was totally calm. She knew exactly what she was doing. She was just, she had it all the way. I want to throw the red flag of BS on that, okay? Because when people are coming down the stretch, they may look, appear on the outside totally in control. But that's why you have a very well-established routine. That's why you have the discipline to not say to yourself, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? You have to have the mindset that says, this is what is. What is in front of me? What's my task? What's my target? So when you step into the shot, you are absolutely 100% committed, this is the shot I'm going with. And if I can get all of you to do that tomorrow, wow, you will have an unbelievable day. I want to thank Annika, I want to thank the Foundation, I want to thank AJGA, I want to personally thank Rob Ono. It seems like I've known you for a long time and I've known you for about an hour and a half. It's fantastic. And I wish all of you great stuff. If you want to see me, that is me. By the way, for those of you who ask, this is my real hair. Okay, this is not a wig. All right, I just wanted you guys just to put that out there because, hey, listen, I know all of you. I have a bad hair day too, okay? So if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me there. Go to my website, theconfidencedoctor.com. You can find me on Instagram, on Facebook. And when I talk about, you know, my trademark, it's change your mind, change your game. What does that mean? It means the moment you change your mind about the things you think about, the things that you're thinking about start to change as well. You know, think big thoughts, create your reality, and do it one shot at a time. Thank you very much. Hey, give a round of applause for Dr. Bob Winters. That's awesome. Dr. Winters is going to stick around for the second part of our More Than Golf session. So if you have a chance to, uh, if you want to ask him any other questions, please do so. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Appreciate it very much. I get the luxury of introducing Annika and Angel again. And, but before I do, I was thinking, um, I never get a chance to thank Annika. I was talking to some parents this afternoon and like hosts of AJJ events. You know, sometimes you're lucky if they come out for that final day for the award ceremony. And I was thinking about it, and I was like, hey, Annika came out to the Junior Am reception to greet all our guests that are supporting this event um, yesterday, uh, or a couple days ago, and then she did the clinic that we turned into a Q&A session yesterday, and then she's spending a couple hours with us tonight to just try to share some life wisdom and do a fireside chat with Angel Yin, and then she's also then coming out tomorrow for to see some of you finish and for the award ceremony. And I was just thinking, like, I don't really think it's that typical that the host will come out for four days. And so I really appreciate what Annika wants to do. She's literally trying to give back and help you all. If you could just give her a round of applause, I'd really appreciate it. And then just for some of the parents, just so you know, we do tournaments like this all around the world, as some of you know because if your daughter played well in a tournament in Europe or Latin America or Asia, uh, we're getting our event in New Zealand restarted, you know, you're getting a chance to play here. But we do junior events around the world. Uh, Annika hosts Share My Passion grassroots clinics around the United States. She hosts a big college tournament that some of you will play in up in Minnesota for the top teams in the country. And now we're actually supporting some young, um, some, uh, young professionals in a couple ways through a development program where we'll be supporting a dozen women as they graduate from college to help them pursue their dreams as a pro golfer. And now we're supporting a women's professional tour and we'll be calling it the Annika Women's All Pro Tour this year, which you can play on to then try to get access to the Epson Tour and LPGA Tour. So we're kind of doing things from six years old, you know, say to 26. And I was thinking that 16 years ago, this event started, and I think it was one of the first initiatives of the foundation. And Annika and the team have built it and grown it to try to you know, reach an impact, people like you, 
and inspire you, give you opportunities. So it's been pretty cool to see what's happened over time. But I'm really proud of, of, of being part of the association, your foundation. So I'll stop with Annika, and then I'm going to change to Angel Yen. I don't know if, yeah, there's the, uh, the little bio on, on Angel. She's obviously one of the top players on the LPGA. Last year, I think she finished 16th on the race to the CME Glow points list. Um, she was actually a former champion of this event, 2015, which I think is pretty cool. She was LPGA Rookie of the Year in 17. She's won on the LET Tour, then she won on the uh, LPGA Tour last year, which was really cool. Um, she's been on three solo and cup teams, so she's a top player. But what I want to share with you is I thought it was really cool. She started golf at age six, which I thought was kind of neat. But then it listed some of her hobbies. So you have to listen to some of these hobbies. I just thought it was so funny. So she had some of the, maybe the typical ones. She loves to read, loves to travel. She's adventurous, so you'll have to ask her, like, what does that mean? But then it said some of her hobbies are eating and hibernating, which I thought was so funny. So you'll have to ask her what that's all about. She's actually considered one of the funniest women on the LPGA Tour, so I'm really excited to introduce and bring up Annika and Angel Yen to do a little fireside chat for all of you. Annika, Angel, I don't know where you all are. And Angel will have to explain why she's in a wheelchair, so I'll let her do all that. I brought my own chair to the party. <laughs> well, that means I get to sit too, Angel. Isn't that great? Yeah. Where's your caddy? Oh, your caddy left. I'm kind of caddy. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, we were supposed to stand up, but. Um, I think that's overrated. Everyone's overrated. Okay. Well, everybody else is sitting, so why don't we do that? We gotta be like the people. Yeah. Well, everybody wants to know why you came wheeled in here like the queen. Um, I got tired of walking because I walk for a living. Yeah. Why not sit for a change? Okay. So you get a little break. So you start. Yeah. I just wanted to bring my own chair to the party. Yeah. How is it going? It's not that expensive, but it was one hundred fifty dollars. Is it lightweight? Like a it was. Club, or it is, and it's yeah. like a. What is it, like a 30-day return policy from Amazon? Is that what it is? Yeah. Is it AI too, somewhere? Mm-hmm. Yeah? You're gonna get my money back somehow. Yeah, I'm sure you need the money. Yeah? You've had a good year. You won last year. Yeah. After... Why don't you talk about you win a little bit? Um... Do you remember? It was fun. Yeah, I do remember this one. The one in Dubai was a little blurry, even though it was in Dubai. <laughs> but, uh... Uh, it was actually really similar to Chevron coming down the stretch and all of a sudden you see Lilia's name up on the leaderboard. Uh, somehow pulled it together even though I wasn't in the best position for my second shot on the 18th hole. But um, hit it on, gave myself an opportunity to be in the playoff and then pulled it through through the playoff. Well done. Why don't you, um, you know, share maybe your story you know, how you got to that playoff, like, let's go back a few years, maybe, yeah, plus years. Maybe talk a little bit about your, well, Rob told us about some of your hobbies. I know we're interested in those, but, like, what, what, uh, what took you into golf, and why did you continue, and what kind of drives you today? So, I got introduced to golf from my mom's friend. Like, no one in our family knows about golf. Uh, plays golf, so we were really, really dumb to golf. Like, we were like, what is this? We even bought a book and it was not about golf. You know, it was like those sports where like there's little hoops on the ground and then you put the ball in between your feet and you hit it. Like, yeah. like, I, can't, I can't remember what it's called, but she bought a book to learn about golf, but that ended up being the book she bought. Because, um, and then my mom's friend wanted her son to learn how to play golf because her, her dad, like his dad played a lot and they wanted a partner because it's always more fun when two people, two kids learn how to play. So I was that partner and I picked it up and I really, really liked it and really enjoyed it. And um, I told my mom to leave me at the golf course for a few hours because we, it was a, I grew up in a Muni and at that time the Muni had this junior academy where they introduced golf to kids. How old are you now? I am, uh, 
25. Well, not now. I'm in that. Sorry. Oh, then. <laughs> like when, when you went to Six years old. I was six years old. You were six. Okay. Yeah. I was six years old. So it was just a bunch of kids, a bunch of clothes on the ground. You grab it, you hit it, whack it around. And you start out with putting, and then you build it up. Because it was like seven stages, I think. And then I would start at level one, and then you build up. And you graduate from level one and level two, and then you build up. And I just really liked it. So I asked my mom to put me at the golf course. So I can practice, and I just kind of mimicked everyone else around me in their swings. And then the, because uh, I was six, uh, the pro shop employees were very nice, and they were a little worried why a six-year-old is out there by themselves. And then um, they got me, they taught me more about golf. They taught me how to keep score. They said that, hey, buy some of your own clubs. Um, and then they were like, hey, maybe get some private lessons. So that's how I got introduced to the game of golf. And then you started to compete in some events? When I was seven years old, yeah, really oh, quickly. Oh, really? Oh, one year later, okay. Yeah. Um, and how did that go for you? Not bad. I had a bad tantrum. Mm -hmm. So I got banned from playing golf for a few months. But I got into my mom's good graces again after uh, days and days of begging. Um, it was very persistent. So then she let me play again, and then when I was eight, I, you know, I got a little more success winning the junior world and doing all of the other stuff. But yeah, that, that's I'm proud of success. Yeah. yeah. So how did I mean at the age of seven to have tantrums, and then how did you quickly get away from that? It sounds like uh, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? Uh, no. I just uh, was able to hide it a little bit better, but I think I, just, I really did struggle with it probably until I don't know couple years ago, like probably second year as a professional, I got a little bit better hang of it, um, third year was better as I progressed, but then, you know, I'm actually coming, it's an interesting story because I stopped feeling emotions for about, since COVID, and I just like kind of flatlined, whenever a bogey or a birdie, it's just like, I became like Indy Park, you know, someone has to check for a pulse. Uh, and then this year, last, last year, 2023, I was like, no, I don't think this is going to work. Because I actually had to talk with Julie Inkster. She was like, hey, you know, you, you should get mad again. And I was like, okay. It was actually hard getting mad again. Because it's like this fire. But what I've learned through that is, you know, when you care for something, you have to feel emotions. Obviously not to an extent where you're just like throwing tantrums out on a golf course. But if you flatline, to me, not everyone, right? I mean, it works for Indy. But for me, it, it just... Um, like, why am I even out here playing golf? Might as well go build Legos. I have more excitement there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what uh, Dr. Bob said about playing your own game and, and being yourself out there. Um, but then, let's talk a little bit. So, you play Junior World, and then um, you play some AJJ events, and because we have, you know, several players here that, you know, starting AJJ, maybe they're ending AJJ, they're just kind of, you know, they're in the middle of their amateur career, and. Uh, it's not that long ago that you were there. I mean, can you, do you remember your time there and kind of what was going through your mind or maybe some things you learned or maybe you have some tips for these young ladies how to, you know, to have kind of a, a great career like you're having? Um, I've only won one AJGA event and that was uh, your tournament. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, it was very interesting because I didn't play golf for like two months before your tournament. And then I won by a mile, and I was like, oh, well, maybe that's why you need to take another ready. two. <laughs> yeah, I need to take another two months off. Yeah. Um, and I think this was a tournament in, shortly after, and so, like at the end of the year, I, I think I turned pro. But um, I kind of struggled during the EJGA era because everyone was really, really good, um, and competition got even tighter. And then I was questioning whether, you know, I was being pressured too much by my mother. And I really liked it that as much as I did. I mean, I love golf, but you know, when you get pressure that much at that age, it gets difficult in your mind. Like, hey, I want to do other things too in life. Like when other kids are going to prom, or when other kids are doing like joining key club, having adventures outside, doing school trips to New York, doing all the other things. You're like, hey, is golf really something I want? I mean, you want it as a six-year-old, but from six to sixteen, that's a decade of time, and you mature. As a kid, your brain develops more, you create more interest, and you're like, is this a hobby or is this a profession I wanted? So I think I really struggled with that. So I wasn't, I didn't practice as hard. I mean, I practiced every day because my mother was there, you know, pressuring me to practice a lot. But mentally, I was like, am I in or am I out? But you know, obviously, I made my decision because I still wanted it, and I tried out Q school, and then I got through, and I made my decision to turn professional. 
And even then, I still struggled a little bit because when, you know, I didn't play that well during my career, I was like, okay, maybe I need to search for something else. Um, so that's what I struggled with during EJGA, and I think, um, you know, it was always cool to see other people win at EJGA, but David Ledbetter said this to me. He goes, no one really cares about what you do as a junior. It's more about your professional. It's cool to build up, up the confidence and the resume, but when you're a professional, I mean, that's where it matters, and I think that really resonated with me. So you play AGDA, and then you um, turn professional. What would you say was the biggest, maybe, challenge, or what was the biggest change to go from amateur golf to, I mean, all of a sudden it's professional, right? You, I mean, I'm sure you still had some of your support system there, but what would you say was the biggest change? Turning out my game. I mean, from growing up in a family that didn't know about golf, it really shows. I didn't know anything about golf. And uh, everything I learned in professional golf, I could have learned, like, learned that in college or if someone was more experienced. But I really, my game was sloppy as a kid. I just had a lot of talent where I hit it so far. And my short game was good. So my putting was bad, but it could be covered up with distance and the ball striking and obviously the short game. So I never like really had a magnifying glass on my game until I went on the LPGA. And then I was like, okay, well, I really need to tighten up this and you learn this and you learn that. And um, that's, that's what really changed for me from amateur to professional. So um, you said you really didn't have anybody at home that knew about the game, but so how did you learn all this? I mean, did you um, look at other players or you mentioned David Ledbetter? I mean, who was... Did you have somebody, like somebody that would mentor you, or I mean, did you buy more books and read? And or how did you? I mean, you've come a long ways. Uh, I didn't read about it in books because my books that I like to read were Percy Jackson. It's more of a more mythology. Didn't really help me in golf. More just on the Greek side. But uh, uh, everyone, just talking to everyone. My caddies helped me a lot. Just speaking to them when I hired them, they were like, "Hey, Angel, like you know, try out." Uh, controlling your distances from 30 to 70 yards and do it in increments of 10 and then try to get it on a spot because that's what you really need short game and then there's long holes and planning it out uh, course management so it wasn't just one person it was everyone around me when you just ask questions you learn and then whoever wants to speak you listen and sometimes there's a lot of useless information but there's a lot of times where there's a hidden gem in there yeah, well, you don't come across as a shy person, so it's probably easy for you to ask questions. But I know a lot of young players, especially, you know, the girls, just, it's, they're afraid to ask. They always think that, oh, this is a stupid question, or, oh, they're going to think that I don't know anything. So a lot of them are quiet. So, um, you know, it's not that easy. I mean, it could be quite a, a lonely road, as you know. Um, I mean, you said there was a, this young boy early on that you play with, but would you say you've had some teammates, or maybe not teammates, but like friends that you kind of hang around that's uh, either on tour or an amateur that kind of helped you also? When I was an amateur, I was a huge loner. Um, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. I was a huge introvert. Um, I still am, but I now express myself with more just open and friendly to other people. But when I was an amateur, I didn't speak to anybody and I was really shy. And like me thinking about winning a tournament to give a speech was petrifying. Like, I think I might have just like cried on the spot because I was so afraid of just public things and speaking to like, let's just say a lot of large number of people in the crowd. Um, and um, I don't know, it was just, I think it was blessed with people that wanted to speak at me. And I really took that to heart because like, I think, I mean, it's not a bad thing, but a lot of adults like to share their knowledge and share their wisdom. And you just need to listen. Um, and then, what I've learned is just ask questions. And I know it's difficult because there's a lot of kids there who are pretty shy, but um, a few questions here and there. I don't really know if that made any sense. Well, I think we have that in common. It was the same thing for me growing up. I was also very shy. and uh, But I think this, this sport is, has helped me to deal with the shyness, you know, giving me confidence. And I know you, you know, just looking at you and, and Soham Cup, um, just to see you as a kind of a, a a key player there, at least that's what comes across, you know, you seem so, um, you know, give some energy and fun to the team. Do you want to share a little bit about the Soham Cup experiences you have? I'm sure there's many here that it, that's on their bucket list one day. 
I mean, it's pretty awesome because I jumped from so junior Solheim two years later into actual Solheim, and um, I think our team that year at Des Moines was unbelievable. We had so many characters um, and so many veterans that played, and they just come up and speak to you. They don't, you don't need to ask them anything. They just come up to you and be like, "Hey, are you nervous?" Because if you're nervous, don't be nervous, and they just like tell you their stories. Um, and it was actually really cool because you really felt like, hey, they got your back, and you hit a bad shot, no, don't worry, they're like the best players in the world, they're gonna get your back. I mean, you can't deny that there's drama that happens within the team room, that's just the perks of it. got you but something about the actual Solheim there it, you really feel like it's a huge family I mean for that one week you know after that yeah, right. it's a different story but hey it's okay <laughs> well you come into it you're competitors and then you're super best friends and then you're like okay well thank you very much and yeah. then you go on and I mean like, you still do memories you still okay. do talk to European players oh, yeah, after that week not during that week but yeah. after that week you still be friends but um, I got really close to Lizette who has like a nine year difference between me, but we became really close after so long. We bond with players during that week because it's so special. The adrenaline that you go through is none like other. You do crazy stuff, you chip in, you pull out, you do all kinds of stuff. Like my first Solheim, I think I was averaging around 270 carry, 280 carry, something like that. I was hitting drives at like 340. I was like, I know, I was watching. <laughs> I was flying by the pump. I was so fun. No, yeah. I was so crazy. So, uh, Andrew, here we are, and it's the beginning of uh, 2024. And I know right now you're kind of battling a little bit of a maybe un you know <laughs> unplanned injury, right? But did you have any uh, New Year's resolution you want to share, or maybe even some goals? What are you looking forward to in 24, other than get out of this chair for the moment? Um, New Year resolution: say no. I got my foot broken because I didn't say no. I wasn't, uh, I gave into peer pressure. And that's something that I've always had as a kid too. Um, I've gotten better as I got older, but peer pressure is something that I always give into. So this year I'm gonna say no. No is no, and I have to stick to it. No matter how many people say, hey, just do this, or if you don't do it, then no one in the group is gonna ever do it. And you just, well, okay, then too bad for you guys, right? You invited me out here. And I just have to be very firm with my answer and just stay true to myself because I always say, I wanna seek for the truth, I'm a truth seeker. Yet, when I don't stay true to myself, and that's the worst thing I could possibly do. And that will only take me further away from my goals I wanna be achieving in life. Yeah, so what are some of your goals for 24? So I'm again. So we have back to back so on. That's we'll right. Just coming kind of this year again. It's a quick turnaround. Normally it's really, every other year. Really it's going to be that played cup. in, uh, I know you do. Um, <laughs> Europe has it. <laughs> I know, and I have my USA hat on. <laughs> I know. Well, it's appropriate here. Um, okay, so so what do you need to do to make the team, you think? Um, well, obviously, play good golf, right? Yeah. Or, you know. Give Stacy some cash, but I think good golf will be an easier one. Yeah, I think that'd be more a guarantee. Mm -hmm. And then uh, try to do what I did last year. And last year, I similar to this year's goal: stay true to myself, listen to my body. Uh, what do I want to do instead of what others want me to do? And if I want to take rest, take rest because it's about quality, not quantity. And I think I'm going to really stick to that. Last year, I played. I think 17 events, which is the least amount of events I've played, and I had the most amount of success. And so that really s says a lot, and I'm gonna try to stay true to that and consistent to that. So you mentioned Soham Cup, uh, but this is also a, an Olympic year. Uh, golf is back in the Olympics, it will be played in Paris uh, in August. How, um, what does that on, where, does that, where do you put that on your radar? 
that's very high. It's higher than uh, the soul line, but it's also meaning that it's the hardest one because there's only four people that get to play. Um, and I gotta say, the U.S. players are really good. <laughs> so I think for that one, it's not. It's realistic because every single goal is realistic, but. I wanted to focus on that so hard just because it's like, okay, if I do all the things I need to do and I get it, then it's great. But if I put so much of it in like one basket and I get disappointed later on, I don't think that would be good for me mentally and for the long run. So I, I want to, uh, I mean, that's on my list, but it's not my main focus. Uh, did you grow up watching the Olympics, winter and summer? Yeah, I mean, Olympics to me means so much. Um, do you have any, uh, what's some of you, I mean, what? Some favorite athletes or somebody or sports you would tune into? Um, oh, you put me on the spot. I'm so bad with names. I just know what they look like. Uh, well, obviously, you saying Bolt. It was unbelievable. And then, um, well, he turned out to be killing his wife. But, uh, you know, that guy with no legs. Oscar? Yeah, Oscar, he just got released from jail. But, uh, yeah, the South African. <laughs> We're working on role models right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the Blade Runner. Yeah. What was his name? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be a movie one day. Um, and I really liked it because he was good looking, and then he eventually killed his wife, so. Uh, we're working on it. Okay, well, maybe we should see. move on. Um, uh, anyway, what, uh, what do you think? Should we uh, open up to some questions here? You just said they were shy. They're not going to ask. No? Well, Taylor has a mic. You know, we, we do something here. We... She would just kind of close her eye and pick somebody otherwise. Oh, there's one right there. Yeah, take her in here. Going once, twice. Oh, there's really good ice cream over there. Just <laughs> letting you guys know. Okay, this might be a silly oh, question, this. This but why did you decide not to play in college and turn pro? Well, uh, I got my tour card full card on the European tour. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do this eventually, and I just got an opportunity of a lifetime, because there's all good golfers who play at the Q School. And I got in, so I was like, I called up Andrew, because I was thinking of going to SC. Andrew Gaston was the uh, head coach at that time. And I said, well, I think school can wait. I'm gonna go and turn pro first. And if it doesn't work out, the school's always there. <laughs> so, uh, pick something that's always gonna be there, or pick something that isn't always there. So I picked the one that isn't always there. Anybody else? Oh, come on, everybody. This is a one time this is really dead lifetime house. opportunity to be in front of Angel right here asking her questions about her in a wheelchair. Yeah, it might not happen again. I don't think it will ever happen. I, don't, I hope I'm not in a wheelchair. No, again. I'm not happy. So I'm going to have to sell this thing after. I, I get me one back here. Yeah. Hi. Um, what's your favorite book that you read during 2023? That's a hard question. But you'd like to read, right? Diary of the Rumpy Kid. Okay. <laughs> Loaded Diaper. <laughs> oh, I can't remember. Um, I gotta tell you. I don't remember a lot of things. My memory is gone as I got older. I hope everyone can relate here as, you know, the parents, hopefully. Okay. It's not just me. What else? Doesn't have to be golf related. No, it could be. Could be another book I read. Diary of the Wimpy Kid, Lost on Vacation. And Rob said you like to hibernate. Are we waiting for questions? What does that mean? Uh, sleep a lot, wake up at bad hours, starve, eat one meal a day, gain some weight, and then have to get into season. That's my hibernation. Okay, okay. Yeah. How long does that last? The entire off season. The entire off season. I mean, I did it more this year because I was going to go on vacation, go see the world. Uh, it didn't happen. You wanted to travel on your days off. I mean, is it normally if you talk to any other pro golfer, all they say is, "Oh my, when I have a break, I don't want to move. I don't want to get on a plane." And, and you want to get on a plane around the world? Yeah. And the first day in landing in Austria, I broke my foot. So so much for that. I think next this year off-season starts, I might rethink my life choices. Okay. Yeah. But I wanted to go to Japan. Yeah? Everyone and their moms were there. Did you not play this year in Japan? No, I didn't. Why not? I was trying to stay true to myself and try to win CME. Oh, didn't play yeah. that well. well, that's a big event. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, maybe uh, this year you can put that on your list. Oh, here we have the question. Hi. Uh, what's your favorite golf course you've ever played and why? Uh, Dubai, because I won there. Uh, I liked Marion a lot in Philadelphia just because the course layout was unbelievable. They actually had the Players Cup there uh, yeah. two years ago, I think. Um, unbelievable layout, such a tight space, but they made it work. Everything about the history of the golf course is unbelievable. They hosted uh, the Men's Series Open. I wonder if they will host the Women's Open. What do you think? I don't know. Hopefully. It has all the characteristics that you need. It's got. Um, I really played good. it too. It's, it's one of my top five courses for sure. And uh, I don't know if it's long enough for the men. You know, we'll kind of take the, the courses that gets too short for the men we take. You know, we're kind of the leftover ones. But that would be a nice one to be a leftover. Yeah, that is just a really nice leftover one. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually a really good distance for the girls, I think. Yeah. But well, well we're going to go Chicago. Unbelievable. What's the name of the course? Chicago Golf Club. Oh, yeah. Lord Davies won, I think. There, yeah. yeah. Well, that was the women's uh, senior, yeah. It'd be great. What, well, why don't we uh, talk about some of the tournament courses that we played? I mean, what's your, what stands out? Or, 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 or let's put it this way. How would you set up a course that would fit your game? Long, very long. How long? <laughs> let's go like 68, 69, shoot for the moon. Yeah? yeah? Okay, what else? So now we have a course of 6,900 yards. Um, uh, what is those greens called? Like when they sit up on top? Elevated? Elevated greens. Cool. Oh. Okay, so we want elevated, elevated green. That's going to make it even longer, you know. Perfect. So the Anna Norcas can't put it up, or she might find a way to do oh, so. Oh, she might. Okay. <laughs> it's unbelievable how she good she puts like that. I know. I, she's. I played with her at Royal Troon. I think it was like 60 yards away from the hole. She was putting? Mm -hmm. well, I know she was struggling a little bit with, you know, her chipping, so she decided to putt, and it's really paid off. If you can putt like that, there's no reason for you to have a leg in your hand. You would putt everywhere. Oh, I put everywhere. I can't putt off the green. That's the problem. Well, you, you just hit a lot of greens. So there you go. Okay, so now we got long course, elevated greens. You like bunkers? Nah, I'm okay. So no bunkers. I like tree line. Oh, lots of trees. Mm. Oh, ah, okay. Because like when I go in the trees, I can maneuver myself away around it. And some people struggle, so. Well. So maybe one day we'll see an angel yin course, super long, tree lined, elevated greens. So. Yep. There we go. Yeah, will you sign up to play? Now we got a few, yes, over here. Anybody else? I know it's been a long day for a lot of these young ladies. They, they played yesterday and today, and tomorrow is the, the final day. And it, wow. it, there's a lot on, on uh, the line here because whoever wins here uh, gets a chance to play as an amateur in the Hilton Grand Vacation at Lake Nona. What? Yeah, this is this is not just any AJJ event, you know. This I know. Is, this is the Anaka Invitational. We do things right here. I and agree. They get an invite to Epson Tour later in the year. Wow. Yeah. You might want to, you know, just, you can hang around us for a while if you want. Yeah, I'm hanging around. I just pulled out a TOC, so whoever is playing and winning, a winning and then playing, you will not see me. There's a question in the back. Oh, never mind, sorry. Um, when you first started in like your first tournament in the PGA Tour, um, who were you like most excited to meet for the players? Uh, myself. <laughs> I don't know, I'm a little weird. I don't really like, I mean I look up to people, but as soon as I step on the golf course, I'm like, okay, I can't look up to them anymore. Um, I'm a competitor like them. So my, my mind worked different. But when I went to watch Annika play, I was like, whoa, Annika, <laughs> you won that week, I think. I can't remember where I watched you, but you won. That's all I remember. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We got another one back here. Um, what's your favorite snack on the golf course? So I've really liked peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but <clears throat> it's like a high maintenance snack. I only really get it when I play Solheim because other people make it for me. So when I'm on my course on the course by myself, I just do beef jerky. Do you make your own beef jerky, or do you like to cook? Uh, I like to cook, but I don't have time, so no, not anymore. So how do you feed yourself? Um, take outs. Take outs. Yeah. Yeah. Here. I think we have one question over here. How far do you get drivers? How do you, if you since you're so long, what do you like, work on to maintain your distance? Um, 
I mean, I've always hit it really long. I drink a lot of milk. Uh, that was my secret. That's the key? That was You're my telling key. telling me that now? It's a little late. Get some raw me. milk at your local dairy farm. Uh, okay. I was in it really long. And then uh, now, now I don't really think distance matters that much. It was overrated. As I got on tour, I learned that you need to be more precise. You need to have like a short game. You need to control your distance. It's more about control than just free for all, hitting it everywhere. But anyways, to answer your question, I hit it around. 75 to 80 right now. I mean, I'm pretty sure a few girls out here can like outdrive me easily. Yeah. Raise your hand. No? <laughs> they are shy. Yes, they are shy. We got one more here, I think. Um, I think we got some future LPGA stars coming up, and I was wondering with your experience on the Angel, if you can go to the majors and give these girls some pointers about the courses that the majors are on. Maybe one day, maybe help them to it. You want to start? You you play more majors than me. <laughs> How many more? A lot more. Uh, stop counting. It's more than 10 fingers. And uh, that motivates you, I hope. <laughs> it does. Uh, major courses. Uh, KPMG is usually always long. Um, got some Yes, long. But you've been playing some good courses. You know, yeah. KPMG, what they have done when they stepped in uh, to sponsor the, the women, what I liked about it, not just the purse was incredible, but what they did is they took the women to courses that we would call bucket list courses, dream courses, that we had never really been before. I mean, Balls of Straws last year. Yeah, I mean, it's been some incredible courses, which I think elevates uh, women's golf because people all of a sudden they're like, excited, oh, they're playing this course that you know I want to play or I've played or the men have played there before. So KPMG has done a good job there. Yeah, I mean, to piggyback off of that, uh, Pebble Beach was huge. It was not just a lot of golf lovers. It was just a lot of people who wanted to see scenic areas. So it was a little chaotic, but you know, gained a lot of eyeballs. But uh, anyways, like KPMG is long. US Open is really known for this accuracy and tightness, and it also plays long. British is just, you know, links roll it around. Not very good. I'm trying to crack that code right now. Um, but that's where you need to putt everywhere. Yeah, you I know. Keep it low. I'm you just gonna, is it going to St. Andrews this year? It is. Yeah. I'm a golf. Yeah. You know, very exciting. Are you going to go? I don't know. I have no plans at the moment, but uh, I played there the first time we had, with Lorraine Ochoa won, 2007, I believe. Um, and that was also great for women's golf. 100%. And then, um, wait, you had St. Andrews this year, and there was another one that was huge. Lancaster. Lancaster. Yeah, the US Open. Uh, it was, they hosted, they host several USJ Championship. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was India Chun that won there, I believe. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, so it's returning to um, another classic golf course. And then the Evian, which is played in Evian. <laughs> It's, uh, that one is uh, that one is just the way it is. That one's just right? good luck. May God be with you. Yeah, it's a little bit hilly. It is. It is hilly. It is very hilly, and it's very tricky. Um, it's actually. I feel like it's gotten better over the years. Yeah, I mean they put a lot of money into that. It's the, the fifth major, I would say. Um, you know, they just they they really take good care of you. you stay in a nice place, and they're really trying to do everything around it. And the water is not too shabby. No, they switched the dates and now it's actually pretty nice. Good. Yeah. Ah, we have oh. more questions? One more question. You know, so we have some players, I'm sure you heard her accent, but they're from South Africa. Oh, really? Yeah, have you been there? No, I'm not. Is that on your world uh, travel list? That is, but I think it's going to wait a little bit. <laughs> wait a little bit? Okay. What is your training that look like? Um, so, Monday, start to play a few holes, usually nine, um, depending on if I'm in the pro-am or not, and they let you know if you're in the pro-am. If I'm not in the pro-am, it's, it's like those 18-hole pro-ams, then I have to play 18, and then I get Wednesday off. And so I play nine, nine, and then nine for the pro-am. That's what I usually do. So, nine on Monday, nine on Tuesday, nine on Wednesday. Um, 
and I work around it. And then I um, just hit some balls, chip. I don't know, let's just say if I break it down into hours, um, I don't know, three hours, and a whole lot of talking. <laughs> Are you it's surprised? Just a well, that's the thing, you gotta find what works for you, you know, again. It's just, uh, there's different recipes to success. Yeah, and one of my things that I figured out is I really don't like seeing people on the golf course, and so this is where my introvert comes out. I go uh, when no one's on the golf course. So like super early or super late. Very late? No, not super early, super late. Late? Yeah. Oh, do you like to sleep in? I do. All right, so when, do you, when would we see you like show up in the afternoons? One. Okay. <laughs> and a little lunch? A um, little, little lunch, a little ball hitting, warm up, and then see the greens keeper everywhere. Uh, so you're the one that picks up the flags. Yeah, and then I go talk to them. Hey, any tips? And they're like, uh, fairies and greens. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> good tip. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been um, it's been great to have you here, and we really appreciate it. You know, we we have a tradition here with um, Donic invitations. As you know, our tagline is more than golf, and it's even though we talk golf, but it's also about you know interacting with uh, previous winners and stars on the LPGA, and you know this is uh, our 16th edition. So you know we, we've been lucky to have some great winners, and you're one of them. And for you to come here with you know this obstacle, um, and I'm sure you're super bummed to not be playing this week because you know you earned the right to be at the Hilton Grand Vacation. So we. We are uh, very appreciative that you took the time, uh, you committed, and you um, you stayed to your commitment. That means a lot to us, and we appreciate you sharing stories. And you know, uh, a few years from now, there's going to be some of the players here that's going to be in your uh, I shouldn't say shoes because you're not wearing shoes, but you know what I mean. I'm wearing my Crocs. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, thanks for sharing the stories and. Um, I think we're going to, I know the players are tired, but we're going to do some photos if you want. I don't know how you want to do, you know, if you want to do some cartwheels or just kind of stand there next to me, leaning on me, I'm happy. But I know some players really, you know, admire you and may want to take some photos. Are you okay with that? Yeah. $5 a photo. Okay. Get your wallets out. Well, that's, that's cheap. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's for the kids. I know. Yeah. You're very generous. And I'm sure you can write it off too. And we are a foundation. Yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah. Right here. Everybody's happy. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for the great food here at Boston Park. Thank you.